Well, what a wonderful day it is to worship together. So glad that we are here together. So glad you are here with us. And I want to welcome you and encourage you to uh, enjoy and participate in every way the time that we have to share together here this morning and be a part of our uh, other opportunities of Bible study and worship. Uh, our Sunday school hour, of course, some, some of you are already here and, and have enjoyed that time. Let me encourage you, if you've not been a regular part of our Sunday school hour beginning at 9.15 on Sunday morning, uh, be here. We're going to kind of emphasize that a little bit more in just a few moments when we talk about the importance of doing this faith journey with Jesus together. But let me encourage you to be a part of our Sunday school hour, our uh, Sunday uh, evening uh, discipleship time as well. Wednesday nights, uh, full schedule kicks off this week, beginning with our Wednesday night supper at 5.30. It's going to be a great time to get that back in motion, our children's and youth activities as well. Those kicking off at 6 and 6.30 respectively. Let me encourage you to be a part of that. Bring someone with you and uh, let's, let's enjoy those times of fellowship and Bible study together drawing near, walking this journey, doing uh, this journey with Jesus that we call faith, that we call being a Christian. We need to do it together. And there are a lot of opportunities that we have on a regular basis and other special opportunities that you see uh, in your uh, bulletin and uh, you keep up with that. Uh, we try to get that out as quickly as we can through Facebook and website and other things. But thank you so much for being here today. What a joy it is to celebrate and to know that as we uh, walk together uh, with our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we have a strength and a grace uh, and a mercy that we find nowhere else. But not only for our sakes, but for those whom we touch along the way every day. So let's pray. And I want to thank God for each one of you and for the time we share together. And then let's worship the Lord together. Father, what a joy it is. What a privilege it is to be here in this place and to know uh, the promise of your word is true that even where two or three are gathered, you are in the midst. So whether it's just a few or whether it's a multitude or somewhere in between, oh, when we worship together, uh, heaven, uh, heaven stops to listen. The angels uh, look and, 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 and wonder what it is like to be able to celebrate the salvation of Jesus Christ. For these are things that even the angels do not understand. So I pray that we would, would, would realize and, 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 and dig deep into the joy that we have in Jesus today. Father, I thank you that as we worship together, we uh, are stronger together, we, we are encouraged together, we are challenged together, and then we go together uh, with the mission and the message that you have given to us across the street and around the world and everywhere in between. Lord, as we go, I pray that we would do so with a heart's desire. Uh, to declare the goodness and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and I pray that you would open our eyes and open our ears and our hearts right here in Evergreen, Alabama, and allow us to not just see the needs, but Lord, would you burden our hearts? Would you, would you fill uh, those uh, chambers of our hearts with compassion uh, to, to reach and to give and to love and to touch the lives of others uh, in the way that you uh, have touched us, in the way that you have loved us with uh, uh, so great a love and so great a salvation. So, Father, I pray that as we worship today, uh, again, we would be encouraged and challenged and that you would be glorified and lifted up in every way. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a joy it is to worship together this morning. And as we open our hymnals together, we want to sing praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Let's sing our praise to the Father today. And then that little chorus, Lord, I lift your name on high.
as we walk with the Lord day by day, uh, one thing uh, it becomes very obvious, and that is the, the foundation upon which we stand is solid. And the hymn writer uh, reminds us of that uh, with the beautiful uh, hymn, Higher Ground, and that, and that prayer, Lord, lift me up, let me stand by faith on heaven's table. And as we walk with the Lord now, it is though we are walking on the way that leads us to heaven. Let's sing about that higher ground this morning. Let's open God's Word together. I pray that you have your copy right there in hand. Acts chapter 18 is where we will be today. As we come to the conclusion of Paul's second missionary journey, we are calling this series to the ends of the earth. Today, focusing especially on endurance through the ups and downs. Endurance through the ups and downs. Well, if you have watched, and I realize there has been some concerns and even controversies, and there always is during the two weeks that we call the Olympics. But if you have watched the Olympics, and I so enjoy watching these athletes who have honed their skills to such precise expert levels, it always amazes me. Every time I sit and watch, I am amazed and overwhelmed again and again. So if you've watched the Olympics, perhaps, over these last couple of weeks, uh, you have uh, heard names perhaps for the first time or maybe some of those names that you realize as you watch them you were watching history be made uh, two of those uh, in the first week the first week of the Olympics uh, is dominated uh, quite a bit by swimming and gymnastics and two names uh, that were very prominent during the first week of the Olympics Katie Ledecky uh, an American swimmer, the most decorated female American Olympian of all time. And we had the opportunity to watch her. You had the opportunity to watch her. Literally, history being made right before our eyes. A name that will live in athletic infamy. 
because of her accomplishments. And then, of course, uh, Simone Biles, uh, a name that, again, will forever uh, be a, a, a benchmark in the uh, field of women's gymnastics. The most decorated gymnast ever. When you take her Olympic accomplishments and her world championship accomplishments, the most decorated gymnast of all time. Of all time. What an amazing uh, time that, uh, that, that we are in to see such, such uh, athletic skills and ability. And every, every generation has had those individuals. Let me mention one. Some of you uh, will remember this name, even when I just mentioned her first name. Her first name, I will begin with, uh, was Wilma. Wilma. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Wilma did not get much of a head start in life. Uh, after a bout with polio, uh, which left her leg crooked and her foot twisted inward. She grew up, as many children did in her day, having to wear braces on her legs. After seven years of painful therapy, her story goes that she could walk without her braces. Uh, so she, she wanted to do everything that girls her age did. So at the age of 12, she tried out for the girls' basketball team, but did not make it. Determined, she practiced and practiced with her friends every day. The next year, she made the team. But it so happened that one night when she was playing in her high school years, there was a college track coach in the stands, and he watched her and observed her and met her after the game and talked her into letting him coach her as a runner. He just saw something in her. By the age of 14, she could outrun the fastest sprinters in the U.S. And in 1956, made the U.S. Olympic team, but uh, as a rookie, as, as so often uh, the rookies do, uh, did not do well against uh, all of the other Olympians and the pressure that went along with it. She was very disappointed, but yet motivated to work harder than ever before. And in the 1960 Olympics in Rome, Wilma Rudolph won three gold medals. At that time, the most a woman, the most a female, had ever won. So in 1960, Wilma Rudolph was the Simone Biles, the Katie Ledecky. But what an amazing journey through polio. What I must remind myself every time I watch these Olympians compete is that for the few minutes or sometimes even seconds, depending on what event that you're watching, of incredible athletic performance that we see on TV, that has been preceded by years and years and years of agonizing training and endurance through many ups and downs. I mean, the conversation, of course, this year uh, concerning Simone Biles has been the last uh, Summer Olympics where she uh, just literally in the middle of the competition just, just had to I had to press the pause button because of just the mental and emotional struggles that she was dealing with and could no longer compete safely uh, and adequately. In our daily lives, think about where you and I, and I know I, 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 don't, I don't dare even begin to compare myself to an Olympic athlete. But think about right where we are on any given day, what we do, on any given day. In our daily lives, in our journey, especially with Jesus Christ, the same thing can happen. We can, we can become uh, so frustrated and overwhelmed by the pain and the struggle that if we're not careful, we, uh, we, we, we give out and we give up. And we forget that it is through the endurance as James says, the testing of our faith that produces the patience and the endurance. Just like Paul, we, we, know, we know that Paul, through his experience, uh, we see uh, enduring the highs and the lows. And now here, uh, over halfway through, really, this study that we are looking at, his three missionary journeys, finishing the second missionary journey, so many highs and lows, and, and, and knowing that, that there were times... Paul was ready to just to give out and, and give up. I believe we see one of those times here 
as Paul spends uh, a lengthy period of time in the city of Corinth. So as we focus in on these few verses at the beginning of Acts chapter 18, let's, let's be reminded and let's be sure that it is only in Jesus Christ that we have adequate endurance for the highs and the lows. Let's look at it. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, gone from Athens, now to Corinth, another major, big city, maybe one of the biggest of its day. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And of course, here we are introduced to two of Paul's strong missionary companions, Aquila and Priscilla. He came to them, verse 3, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for they were tent makers. Uh, we most often read tent makers. Some uh, say that word could be translated leather makers work because the tents were uh, some fabric, some leather. So it could have been a combination of materials there. Uh, but uh, they, they, they worked with their hands. Paul, somewhere along the way, probably much like, for example, Jesus grew up in the house of Joseph learning carpentry. So Paul, uh, at the time uh, perhaps called Saul, did the same thing. Grew up learning uh, to uh, sew fabric and leather uh, into tents and things of that nature. So, what did he do? He lived with them. They worked and lived together. Verse 4, here's what we see virtually at every stop. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, focusing precisely intentionally on Jesus as the Messiah. But when they resisted and blasphemed, here it comes. You knew it was coming, didn't you? When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there. But did he leave town? No. I mean, look at this. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worship, worshiper of God, catch this, whose house was next to the synagogue. <laughs> that just makes me chuckle. I mean, they kicked him out of the synagogue, and what did he do? He went next door. He went next door. Now, now watch this. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul, now this almost sounds like a, this kind of like an addendum here. And this is really what caught my attention when when I read this and began to study this passage again. And the Lord said to Paul at night by vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now, this is not the conclusion of his time at Corinth. But basically between chapter, verse 11 and verse 12, you have a time lapse because verse 12 picks up very near the end of his stay uh, when some other struggle uh, arises and he leaves Corinth uh, and makes a very brief stop in Ephesus before he goes back and makes a stop in Jerusalem and then back to Antioch. We will not spend uh, much time at all there because when we begin the third missionary journey, he spends a great amount of time in Ephesus and uh, some uh, have, have concluded myself as well that uh, that may have been one of his uh, most precious uh, ministry uh, places uh, all along the way. The Olympic Games, we, we, we spoke about the Olympic Games to begin with. The Olympic Games give us an exposure, allow us to see the highest level of athletic physical and mental endurance and expertise. So, so let's, take that, let's take that image 
and ask ourselves now, how can we, like Paul, perhaps maybe we could call Paul one of the greatest spiritual Olympians of all time. I mean, when we read the journey, all that he went through, all that he endured, all that, 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 he, that he faced along the way, maybe one of the, the greatest spiritual Olympians, how can we demonstrate that same kind of endurance through all of the highs and the lows? Not being so quick to say, well, that's, that's it. I, I give up. I'm, I'm, I, I'm give out. I'm going home. How can we, how can we endure through the ups and downs? Well, I, uh, four things uh, just really jumped out here. Three especially in this passage and then one that we will conclude with that, um, that I don't want us to miss. We could read this passage and it, it sounds just rather routine, mundane, kind of that whole highway hypnosis that we talked about. But, oh, there are some great lessons to learn here that I believe will benefit us right here, right now, in the days where we are and in the days ahead. First of all, to, to, to have that endurance that we must have on this journey with Jesus. I believe we see right off the bat, as Paul settles into Corinth, that we need friends working beside us. We need friends working beside us. Now, the key there is not necessarily, the key word is not necessarily friends right here. You notice the word underlined is the word working. Because that's where Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla. Paul did not meet them at church. Now, that's not to say that's a bad place to meet people because it's a great place to meet people. But Paul met some of the first ministry companions and some of his, I believe, would become lifelong ministry companions at work. They shared a common trade and began to build that relationship there at work. And as followers of Jesus Christ, as tempted as we are to build our, our, our most immediate and to long for those, uh, those, those quickest relationships right here, we'll talk about those. You and I have the opportunity to build more and sometimes even deeper, stronger relationships outside of this building. And Paul shows us that right here. So on this journey of faith that we are walking, we need friends working beside us. Aquila and Priscilla, where did they come from? They came from Rome. They were, they were evicted from Rome. They were believers already and and. and, and Claudius kicks them out. All of the Jews, he kicks them out. They were God followers, and perhaps even at this point, Christ followers. We don't have specific details about their conversion, but obviously they were living in such a way where it was obvious that, that, that they, they weren't going to be tolerated in Rome. So they were, we could say, persecuted believers. They could have, they could have gone into hiding. They could have said, no, it's not worth it. Well, what happened? As soon as they meet Paul, they say, hey, let's get together. We got work to do together. Their first connection was at work. We need friends working beside us. Think, think about it. Just think about it in logistical terms. In most cases, we spend more time with the people that we work with than anyone else except family. We spend more time, on the average with the people that we work with. So, so what's the point? The point is there are going to be, on the average, more ministry opportunities, more evangelism opportunities, and then more relationship opportunities with the people that you work with. So that is where we need to see. We don't need to see ministry necessarily as, 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 as being just what happens at church. Paul didn't here in Corinth. He had some great ministry companions there at work, Aquila and Priscilla. Think about it. In, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus didn't say, go to church and make disciples. He didn't. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. You, you've often heard me say that, 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 that you, could, you could translate that as you go. I was looking at it a little bit more this week, and, and it's, it's interesting, something that, that I just, I, I won't say not noticed before, probably forgotten from my, from my Greek class, or at least didn't pay attention in my Greek class and remember it. Uh, but because of the tense, it almost has kind of a past tense assumption that could perhaps be read, having gone, it almost assumes that that's what you're doing. 
having gone into the world, as you are going into the world, make disciples. Make disciples. Wherever. The assumption there is anywhere and everywhere we go. That is why we need to see that for the endurance that is, that is required for this journey of faith, we need, we need friends working beside us. Think about the ministry of Jesus. Think about where Jesus was again and again. Yes, there were times he was in the synagogue. There were times he was in, he was in the temple. But where do we see him the majority of the time doing ministry, doing work? We see him preaching on a hillside. We see him sitting at the table in, a, in the house of a Pharisee. We see him on the streets of Nazareth. We see him on the streets of Capernaum. We see him on the streets of Jerusalem. Even when there's the risk of him being stoned to death. We see him at Jacob's well, talking to someone that no one else would talk to. We see him send a blind man with mud on his face to the pool of Siloam. Workplace friendships and ministry opportunities there where we are so often, day after day after day, are critical. Critical. What, what, did, what did Solomon write about this? We read it in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. He's talking about those work relationships that we have, the friendships that are built along the way. Now, obviously, be careful. This is critical. We're talking about, we're talking about spiritual relationships. We're talking about relationships that, that, that benefit the, the ministry of the gospel. But, but you see it here and how important those friendships are. Verse 12, he goes on and says, And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Oh, oh my. What a mission field we have. Every day when we go to the places that we go, when we meet the people that we meet, when we work in the places that we work, when we... When we uh, Communicate with, with those that, that we know so very well. Do we, do we live the gospel there? That's the mission field. That's the ministry that God has given each one of us. And it's, and it's different. It's unique. With each and every one of us, it's unique. And that is where so often that, that endurance level is, is is, is, is boosted and blessed when we have those friends like Paul did. Those first friends there when, when he met Aquila and Priscilla. The second thing we see now as we move on into Paul's stay at Corinth is not only for the endurance that we need in this journey do we need friends who are working beside us, but perhaps one that is much more familiar now. We need friends worshiping with us. We need friends worshiping with us and here is where I want us to see how what we do here when we gather together uh, week after week is so very important uh, Paul goes as he customarily does to the synagogue he goes where the people are worshiping and he begins to talk to them about Jesus because that is the focus that is his mission that is his message and he begins to talk to them about Jesus and as typically happened given just a little bit of time the opposition in the synagogue begins to rise uh, there, there is a jealousy, there is a disagreement that uh, even at times becomes violent. So when it gets too loud and too vicious, what does Paul do? Uh, does he leave? Does he go home? Does he give up? No, he just goes next door. He literally, here in Corinth, moved next door, moved the Bible study, if you will, next door to the home of, believe, of a believer uh, named Titius Justus. Some say that it could be translated Titus. Uh, and they were joined by many others, including the leader of the synagogue. Never think that your uh, witness for Jesus Christ is a waste. Never, ever, ever think that your witness, that your testimony shared, that an opportunity sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is a waste. I have discovered over the years, and perhaps you have too, that for the Christian, some of the most precious and most enduring relationships that you will ever have will be formed right here, right here in your church family. And I'm one of those that, that, that very quickly says, I don't, 
I, I, don't, I don't understand. Now, I'm, I'm grateful that I can say I really have never had to try it. But I don't understand how someone can endure uh, with, with any sense of joy and, and, and thankfulness uh, without a church family. Some of the most precious, some of the most enduring relationships over the years, the different places that God has allowed us to minister, uh, friendships that are still there, that as we have the opportunity, we always love to renew. Think of a, think of a similar kind of theme in a different context. Think of, think of soldiers in combat. Think of soldiers in combat and the total dependence that each one has on the other. Some of you have experienced that. Many of you know individuals, have family members or friends who have experienced that. And maybe you've even heard some of the stories of their dependence upon one another in life or death kind of situations. Now think of the relationships that you have in the church as the spiritual equivalent of soldiers in combat. How did Jesus say it? I mentioned it just a few moments ago as we prayed together in Matthew 18, verse 20. Jesus said, where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. You know, sometimes we think, and old preachers are the world's worst, to think, oh, well, you know, how'd Sunday go? Well, we didn't, didn't have very many there on Sunday. You know, we get, we get caught up in the quantity and... Now, now, listen, don't misunderstand me. That's important. We should desire, we, our heart's desire should be for this place to be filled with, with worshipers, seekers, those who are loving Jesus Christ, those who are looking for Jesus Christ, and everywhere in between. But, but what did Jesus ultimately say? It's, it's not about the size of the crowd. It's about the Savior in the midst. Even where two or three are gathered, He is here. Wow. We need friends. We need friends to help us endure the ups and the downs, working beside us, worshiping with us. But you know what we really, really need? Even more than all of that, as, as wonderful and as precious as those friendships are, you know what we need? We need a heavenly Father reminding us. We need a heavenly Father regularly, faithfully, sometimes even sternly, <laughs> reminding us. I mentioned that as we were reading the text a moment ago that, that verses 9 and 10 almost kind of sounded out of place. You know, you're just reading along about what's going on in, in Corinth and all of a sudden Paul has this vision and Luke writes down this vision that God speaks to him. Why, why is that? Well, what did he say? He said, to Paul, don't be afraid any longer, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No man will attack you in order to harm you. Paul was, Paul was struggling. He was Now, Paul was not one to just write those things down. Oh, man, just had a bad day yesterday. You know, Paul didn't have Facebook, so you know, that wasn't a habit of his like it is so many of ours. When a day goes bad, just type it on Facebook. I want everybody to know. Now, Paul did express that from time to time, but he was struggling. We don't know exactly how, but you know what we do? You know what we do? We imagine that individuals like Paul or other biblical characters never got discouraged. We imagine that they always had it all together, that they had the perfect prayer life. They had the most wonderful, refreshing Bible study time every morning. And as my dad would say, son, now Paul didn't wear pants, so I know it's not apples to apples, but my dad would say sometimes when I would try to put somebody else up on it, he said, son, they put their britches on one leg at a time, just like you do. And that was his, that was his country fried way of saying, no, they don't float six inches off the ground. They're just as real and have just the same kind of hurts and sometimes discouragement and fears. That's where Paul was. And again, we don't know exactly why. But Paul was to the point, perhaps, that he was maybe ready to give up and give in, and he laid his head down that night and was just wrestling with fear. And all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, he hears the voice of God speaking personally, directly to him, do not be afraid any longer. He said, Paul, stop it. Listen to me. I'm with you. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent. Maybe he'd stayed home for a couple. Maybe he'd called in sick. 
and say, I'm just not feeling good today. I don't think I want to go to church. <laughs> don't be afraid. Don't, don't, don't be silent any longer. Paul was struggling. He was struggling. His endurance factor was growing very, very low, maybe physically, maybe emotionally, maybe mentally, maybe spiritually. Maybe it was a combination of all the above. We know later when he writes back to the Corinthians in his second letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about a thorn in the flesh. Some say that was physical. Some say it was emotional. Some say it was, it was uh, uh, logistically. I, I've even heard some say it was, it was the people that were always there causing trouble. They just kind of followed him around, throwing stones verbally or physically all the time. Maybe, this, maybe that was part of what he was wrestling, dealing with here. Not sure. But what Paul needed is what we need. And we need to listen because we have a Heavenly Father that is so faithful to remind us and encourage us and challenge us. What did he, what did he tell Paul? He, he, didn't, he didn't get theologically deep. He didn't get philosophically wide. <laughs> what did he tell Paul? Two things. He said, I'm with you. I'm with you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I'm not complicated. Hey, Paul, I'm still here. But then what else did you tell him? He told them something that we so often need to be reminded when we start having that pity party, uh, preachers included, uh, that, 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 that we're the only one, that nobody else cares. What did he say? He said, you are not alone, Paul. I have many people in this city. Sounds like a prophet one time that hid in a cave on the mountainside, doesn't it? Being chased by a wicked old queen, threatening to kill him. He climbed up a mountain and went in a cave and just pouted. God called him out of that cave and said, hang on. But what did he say in the end? He said, you're not alone. You're not alone. We need a Heavenly Father to remind us. And what, what, what is the next thing that Luke writes? And he stayed there. He settled there for a year and six months. One of the longest ministry stays, one of the longest ministry uh, spots, that uh, tenures that he had. But, you know, here's the great thing about it. God's been in the business of reminding and encouraging us from the beginning, go way, way back, way back. And you hear the words that God gave to Moses to pass along to Joshua and the people as they were about to head into the promised land. Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Oh, listen, was, did, did, did Moses struggle? Did, did Moses have bad days? <laughs> yeah. Did, did Moses disobey God? It's like, yeah. But, oh, God gave him such a simple message for Joshua and the people just before he died. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. We, we need endurance and the ups and downs and and, and, and this, this simple, somewhat, maybe even monotonous passage reminds us where that comes from. It comes from those who, who work beside us, that we build those relationships that ultimately become spiritual relationships. Not just work relationships, but spiritual Christian relationships because that is one of the greatest mission fields that we have on any given day. Those who worship with us. And then our hearing our Heavenly Father through His Word, as His Holy Spirit speaks so personally to us, reminding us, I'm with you. You're not alone. Now, there's one more thing that I want us to mention before we close that is so very critical here, and it's not mentioned explicitly in Paul's experience in Corinth, but he does mention it based on his experience in his next major stop, which is Ephesus. And between Ephesus and Corinth, that's probably the, 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 the most time that he spends anywhere in Corinth, and in Ephesus. And there's one more thing that we need in all of this that we can do right here, right now, and that is prayer. 
Because with those friends working beside us and worshiping with us and a Heavenly Father reminding us what we need to be doing, we need to be a church family praying for one another. You, you need, I need a church family praying for us. Paul doesn't mention it like, I'm, like I said here uh, in, in Corinth, but we do know that he specifically asks the Ephesians to pray for him. We covered this not too long ago in our study of that beautiful little letter. Now, in many of the letters, Paul speaks about praying for those individuals. So, so, so Paul is already doing that. But then when he writes specifically to the Ephesians in chapter 6, near the end of that letter, he asks them to pray for him. Let's look at it there in Ephesians six nineteen, right quick. Pray on my behalf so that the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that proclaiming it I may be, speak boldly as I ought to speak. Remember what we said Paul was asking? Paul was asking them to pray that he would speak the gospel clearly and boldly. Nothing complicated. He didn't say pray that I would get out of jail, pray that I could pass go and collect $200 or whatever. None of that. He said, pray that I would speak clearly and boldly the gospel. It is important, yes, it is important that we work together and we worship together, but it is imperative that we pray for one another. It's imperative that we pray for one another. What happens when we start praying together? What happens when the power of prayer begins to take hold, this is where we acknowledge the sovereignty of God when we pray together. We acknowledge His sovereignty. That without Him, as the, as the songwriter says, we can do nothing. Without Him, we'd surely fail. Without Him, we'd be drifting like a ship without a sail. This is where we also not only acknowledge the sovereignty of God, but this is where we confess the sin in our lives. This is where we get right. It's where we get clean. With God, And ultimately, finally, this is where we renew our surrender to the Savior. And this is something we need to be doing again and again, acknowledging the sovereignty of God, confessing our sin, and renewing our surrender to the Savior. Endurance in the ups and downs. You know, not, not many names will be remembered after this Olympics. A few names will be remembered for their great accomplishments. Any idea how many Olympians are at the Paris Games? I looked it up. Approximately 10,500 Olympians. Yeah. Not many of them will be remembered. Not many of them will be medalists. But you know what? Every single one of them will for the rest of their life be able to say, I am an Olympic athlete. You and I may not be remembered or recognized by, like Paul. But you know what we should always be able to say with great joy and enthusiasm? I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And it is my mission and my message to declare the good news of his salvation across the street, around the world, everywhere in between. Father, I pray that we would do that. I pray that our hearts would be burdened, overwhelmed, filled with compassion for those that we meet day by day. Lord, you, you've given us a mission field where we go most often for a great portion of our lives to school, in the classroom, to work, in the workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, those places that we are most recognized and most well-known. Lord, would you burden our hearts to see those places as as some of the best opportunities we have to, to live intentionally, visibly, evangelistically, loving and serving others like Jesus. And then would you help us to see, Lord, the priority of worshiping together, that strength and that challenge and that, that, that iron sharpening iron, as, as your word says, 
but then ultimately that we would that we would hear the the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit speaking to us through your word, through the communion that we have only in those precious times very close and near to you, that, that you encourage, you remind us that you are with us, that we are not alone. And then all of that enduring, yes, through the ups and downs, living a testimony of faith and faithfulness with each other, together. Lord, help us to see that, help us to do that and I pray that we would take that hope and that joy and that endurance and that we would pass it on, that we would share it, that we would give it away, knowing that it always only comes from Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray and we give thanks today for our salvation. Amen.